For our final episode of the first season, we're going a bit off script. Uh, you still wrote out how I'm supposed to respond to that line. That sounds pretty scripted to me. <laughs> okay, not literally, but a bit topically. For this whole first season of Carry the Two, we've mostly focused on mathematical research and topics like mean field games or game theory. Yes, I remember these topics. Kind of. <laughs> but the S in MC's name does stand for statistical, so let's chat stats. Or, in this case, statistical learning. <sighs> Classes are about to start. Are you really going to make me start learning now? <laughs> Indeed I am. Uh, but for the final episode of our first season, I'm treating us to an old friend. There's no magic in the human brain, right? It doesn't matter that it's carbon-based or silicon-based. If there is a pattern to learn, um, turns out our brains are really good at picking them up. Um, and... Uh, computer programs are also really good at picking up patterns. I know that voice. I should hope so. Uh, but for our audience, allow me to introduce Ben Ruveni, a learning scientist with Duolingo and fellow neuroscientist. Full disclosure, Ben and I were in the same PhD program at Northwestern University. Nowadays, Ben works with product teams at Duolingo to make sure that the features and products they develop have learning outcomes in mind. But wait, what does language learning have anything to do with math or stats? Well, have you ever wondered how your brain goes from hearing a string of sounds to parsing out individual words and meaning? It turns out that we have this ability thanks to a process called statistical learning. Unlike some of our other topics, this is a case where our brain is running the statistics in the background, and we just get to benefit from the process. And I'm assuming because it's Duolingo, researchers have found a way to hijack that system and make it more effective? You read my mind. I'm Sadie Witkowski. And I'm Ian Martin. And you're listening to Carry the Two, a podcast from the Institute for Mathematical and Statistical Innovation, aka MC. This is the podcast where Sadie and I talk about the real world applications of mathematical and statistical research. We might have pretty odd backgrounds to be covering these topics. My background is as a cognitive neuroscientist, and Ian's a high school choir teacher. But it turns out you don't need a degree in mathematics or statistics to know how to apply them to the world around you. I mean, it helps. <laughs> okay, sure, sure. But I think today you'll see how we can benefit from statistics without having to learn any complicated equations. Yeah, you mentioned that we aren't aware of the statistics we're using when we learn a language. How does that work? I mean, I, I think the involvement of math and statistics in language learning doesn't tend to be like very obvious to, to the person doing it. Right. right. If you stop and think about what must be going on <clears throat> behind the scenes to allow, you know, you to make sense of this continuous stream of, of, of audio coming in, then it starts to become more clear that statistics and math must some analogy of statistics and math must be uh, happening. The key to statistical learning in the human brain is that it's like a computer program chugging along in the background. It's just picking up on patterns and trying to make guesses in terms of what's coming next. When it comes to language learning, what do you mean by patterns? Broadly speaking, statistical learning has to do with um, picking up on patterns in the world around us, in the environment. And so if we think about uh, language, something as basic as being able to uh, understand what somebody is saying to you. So right now, as you're listening to me speaking, you probably have the perception of being able to identify individual words that I'm saying, and they sound really clear and obvious to you. But that, in reality, there really aren't breaks between words. It comes in as a continuous stream of of audio. And, you know, if that kind of sounds weird, you can try to listen to a language that you don't know. And at least when I do, I can't make heads or tails of when one word starts and when another word uh, starts. I guess I've never taken the time to step back and think about how listening to someone talk and actually understanding it requires my brain to figure out like, where the breaks happen between the words. 
Yeah, it's kind of crazy because you look at the waveforms of a recording like I do when I'm working on this podcast, and you realize that each word isn't its own distinct little waveform. It all sort of blurs together. Kind of like the teachers of the adults in Charlie Brown. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or the experience of learning a foreign language, right? But let's go back to pulling out the statistics part of statistical learning. If we kind of break down this idea of statistical learning, the statistics part, you can think of it as like, when we talk about statistics, a lot of times we'll talk about the mean, right? And what does the mean mean? It means the average occurrence, right? Something like that, the average value. And so if you think about, let's say, um, the patterns of language, right? There are certain uh, features of the language, certain patterns that tend to occur a lot, right? They tend to occur very frequently. And so average way to construct a sentence will involve some, some set of, of rules. And that's really what we're picking up on. We're picking up on things that happen very frequently versus things that happen infrequently. Okay, so statistical learning is really just pattern recognition? Uh-huh. And we need to hear lots of examples so that we can start to recognize and pull out those patterns. And then, because we want to not just be able to listen to the language, we start to make predictions about what we think we'll hear next and then produce the language ourselves. The fact that I don't have to spend a lot of uh, um, thinking points, thought about how I construct my current sentence, perhaps I have to think about what I want to say. But once I figured out what I want to say, I can just sort of speak it. And that understanding of the grammar of English um, is a product of statistical learning. So it's not just about uh, the perception of the language, listening to the audio, but it's also about how to use the language. Man, this seems like a lot of background work going on in our brains. And we're doing this as babies? I mean, baby brains are basically little sponges just soaking up everything they hear around them and trying to pull out patterns. So if you can think about yourself as a baby before you knew English, for example, that's how you heard English as well. It was just this continuous stream of, of sounds. And over time, right, you, you kind of start to pick up on these patterns, on these statistics that certain sounds in English uh, tend to occur more or less frequently at the beginnings of and ends of words. And as your brain starts to learn uh, what sounds are more frequent in the middle of a word versus the end of a word, you start to be able to pick, to pick out different words. And it's not something that you really have to focus your attention on uh, after a while anyway. It just kind of happens automatically. And that process of you just listening to a bunch of English and suddenly, be, you know, over time being able to, to pick out uh, individual words is statistical learning in progress. It's sort of happening in the background. Um, and so we, we all have had this experience, though we weren't potentially conscious of it happening. Sure, sure, sure. But I'm an adult. And when I wanted to learn Turkish so I could talk to my brother-in-law's family, it was way harder for me to pull out the statistical regularities as you described it. What's that about? You're right that this gets much harder as we age. And part of that reason has less to do with math and more to do with how the wiring of our brains shifts and changes when we hit puberty. But this is a math and stats podcast, so let's stick with the statistics. That makes sense. I mean, I learned French as a kid, and it was way easier than learning a new language now. I'm guessing Ben and the folks at Duolingo have a way to work around this? You know it. But let's take a short break before we jump into the statistical strategies that Duolingo employs to help you learn Turkish or Klingon and make it a bit easier. If you're enjoying learning about the important research shared on our show, there's another University of Chicago Podcast Network show that you should check out. It's called Why This Universe. Why This Universe breaks down the biggest ideas in physics. Join theoretical physicist Dan Hooper and soon-to-be physicist Shalma Wegsman as they answer your questions about dark matter, black holes, quantum mechanics, and more on Why This Universe. 
part of the award-winning University of Chicago Podcast Network. Nuchnech! Bless you? <laughs> okay, actually, that was Klingon for what do you want, since they don't actually have a word for welcome back. And what do you want was the next best option? <laughs> yeah, actually, it's a very direct language. Uh, anyways, let's go back to what we were discussing before the break, namely how Duolingo helps you learn a new language. The first trick is a rather obvious one. So Duolingo, right, is a uh, is a practice first mentality. Ugh, you're basically telling me I need lots of practice to learn something new. I'm looking for a shortcut. This sounds like learning a new instrument, too. You just need a lot of practice, something many of my students choose to ignore. Although I'll doubt I'll be able to convince them with math. They're always trying to learn at the last possible second. <laughs> yeah, I know how that goes. But that's basically how statistics works, right? To recognize a pattern or know how to predict what's coming next, you just have to have lots of experiences and see what tends to happen the most often. So to find the average or a pattern, I need enough examples to see what actually happens most of the time. It makes sense, but it doesn't make it any less tedious. Well, one way we can try to make it a bit easier and require less practice is to draw attention to the pattern that we're trying to learn. There are all sorts of tricks to make it, to make it more salient. You could do more repetitions. Uh, you can draw your attention to it. If I told you, hey, pay attention to this, because in three more whatever, units, words, phrases, you know, uh, syllables, something else is going to happen that's related. Well, suddenly it's not that obscure because you're, you're putting your attention towards it. And so it becomes easier to learn. So if I pay attention to whatever grammatical thing I'm trying to learn, I'll learn it faster. Not going to lie, that's a fundamental tenet of teaching too. Yeah, of course you know that. <laughs> I mean, our brains are basically always looking for patterns, so you don't need attention, but paying attention basically helps process it more deeply, and then you're more likely to learn it quickly. Okay, so my brain is basically a little statistical computer, and I can improve its performance by drawing attention to certain aspects. But this is still a lot of work. Can't you just teach me the rules of a language, and then I can just sort of plug them in and go? <laughs> I know you're a teacher, so you know the answer to this, but it's not the case where if we just read a guidebook of rules to a language, we're suddenly fluent. I asked Ben about learning a language through lectures on grammatical structure, and of course, he shot me down. We have this experience of uh, learning by doing uh, a lot in the real world. And when we're in school, that can be, we, we suddenly are introduced to this new style sort of in quotation marks, new style where you're going to get a lecture and you need to memorize these rules, right? And then you'll know how to how to do past tense. But in fact, what we've discovered over uh, many decades is that there's a difference between memorizing sort of these explicit rules and being able to use them. So just because you know that um, the rules around um, how to make something past tense doesn't necessarily mean that you'll be flawless at it, even though you can recite the rule, right? There is a, a value to doing something and to practicing. It. And part of that value uh, is related to statistical learning, is related to this, to developing this automatic knowledge of how to use a language um, that can be complemented by the sort of explicit classroom lecture style instruction. I know that memorizing rules isn't how it actually works, but it doesn't stop me from wishing it did. It's similar in my teaching. Sometimes I have to remind myself to not get too much in the weeds and to just like do the thing, you know, make the music. Yeah, learning the explicit rules can help, but it doesn't solve the issue of just needing repetition and practice. Formal education, meaning like um, seeing slides or um, studying rules that linguists have, have thought a lot about and have written down is definitely not a requisite to, to being able to be aware of the rules of the language. It just helps a lot. It does help me a lot to have a table with all the grammatical endings written out for conjugating a verb. But as teachers, we also have to find the balance between learning the theory or rules behind a concept and actually applying it. I think this is probably true for most fields. 
And this is something that I find kind of funny. This whole time we've been talking about learning a language, but wouldn't you know it, it turns out this applies for learning the language of math as well. And I think we have this idea in math class that if I just memorize a quadratic equation or Hooke's law, then I quote unquote know math. But that's not really the case, right? How we learn math is really fascinating because if it was all about learning rules, you wouldn't have to practice so much. You would just learn the formula and then you would just know it, right? Implementing the formula, what's the problem, right? I know what the formula is. Just plug and play, right? Plug and chunk. But turns out there's something else that has to be learned. Otherwise, we wouldn't have to practice so much. Um, and so similar, that's, that's very similar to language. There are rules that I could teach you and you could memorize, but it wouldn't be enough. You still have to practice it. There's something else that's learned. And part of that something else is driven by uh, statistical learning. So math, math is everywhere. So basically, if I want to learn Turkish... Or Klingon. Yeah, or Klingon. I should do lots of practice, pay attention to the patterns I'm trying to learn, like grammatical tenses, and also learn the rules explicitly to help get them to stick. Yeah, you basically have to do those three things. And make it fun so the repetitions don't get boring and you lose focus. Those are the tried and true techniques for learning a language. With keeping that thought in mind, you can see how Ben and his colleagues at Duolingo build their courses based on these principles. It's funny because we're a math and statistics podcast, but this episode is really about how your brain is running all these statistics in the background for you. Totally. This is something I sort of brought up to Ben. I am curious about how much of your daily work or your daily life is like actually like doing math or doing stats. Like how much are you? Um, I, I, I wouldn't say that a lot of it uh, is spent doing math. Uh, I think that I think that we let the brain do the math. So not a lot of upfront math, um, but a lot of thought into enabling that math to be done easily by by you. We outsource that. So you don't have to be a math person to use mathematics and statistics all the time. We do a lot of it instinctually. Exactly. And I also really like Ben's outlook on why the work he does is so important. Like, it might seem like a fun hobby just to learn a new language or a means to, you know, make international travel easier, but there are also a lot of really important issues at stake. When I got the opportunity to, uh, to apply these skills to something as important as language learning, which, you know, can be really impactful. For example, it can help bridge uh, cultural differences. It can help you interact with people that you wouldn't otherwise interact with and really understand nuances that perhaps don't exist in your language. Um, and perhaps more importantly, you know, the large parts of the world, um, knowing how to speak English can pretty much guarantee you a much higher paying job. And so it can really be a vehicle to break out of a cycle of poverty and, and create more opportunities. And so it's, it's intellectually interesting to me because it has to do with a lot of what I was interested in, in in graduate school. But it's also, I feel like, extremely impactful to create really good education and make it universally available. You know, all our stuff on Duolingo is free. Um, and so working to make that material as good as possible so that as many people can use it and uh, pursue their goals uh, was a no-brainer for me. Yeah, one of my favorite things about traveling is gaining a new perspective. And a lot of that comes from attempting to learn the local language. It can tell you a lot about the culture's values. For example, in Turkish, when someone makes you food, instead of just saying thank you, you say thank you and elina saluk, which translates to health to your hands or may health come to your hands. There's an extra appreciation and acknowledgement of the physical work it took to make you the food, as well as a kind of blessing that they may continue to provide for themselves and others. I love that that incorporates this whole additional layer of meaning. And you know what? 
I say to this episode on language learning and statistics, kapla. Yes, that, that. <laughs> <laughs> It means success in Klingon, because I think I have successfully convinced you that our brains are just little statistical machines helping us learn a new language through recognizing patterns around us. I feel like this is just like that meme where everything is cake, except in this case, everything is math. <laughs> Something like that. Um, but at the end of this episode, we're actually at the end of season one for Carrie the Two. It's a wrap already? Well, sort of. We'll have a mini season with shorter episodes to help tide our listeners over to the next season. So make sure you're still subscribed to not miss our mini season. And don't forget to check out our show notes in the podcast description for more on Ben's work at Duolingo and further resources on the mathematics and statistics behind how we learn language. We should also mention to keep your eyes peeled for an upcoming course from Duolingo to help learn math. And if you like the show, give us a review on Apple Podcast or Spotify or wherever you listen. By rating and reviewing the show, you really help us spread the word about Carry the Two so that other listeners can discover us. And for more about math research being shared at MC, be sure to check us out online at our homepage, mc.institute. We're also on Twitter at mc underscore institute, as well as Instagram at mc.institute. And that's mc spelled I-M-S-I. And do you have a burning math question? Maybe you have an idea for a story on how mathematics and statistics connect with the world around us. Send us an email with your idea. You can send your feedback, ideas, and more to sadiewit at mc.institute. That's S-A-D-I-E-W-I-T at I-M-S-I dot institute. We'd also like to thank our audio engineer, Tyler Dammy for his production on the show. And music is from Blue Dot Sessions. Lastly, Carry the Two is made possible by the Institute for Mathematical and Statistical Innovation, located on the gorgeous campus of the University of Chicago. We're supported by the National Science Foundation and the University of Chicago. Adios. Um, auf Wiedersehen. Au revoir. Um, Yakshamar. Um, Sayonara. That one. Ja, mata, mata shtane. Why can't I think of other... I just forgot how to say it in Polish. Pa is the like short version. Pa. <laughs> Klingons don't say bye. They're very efficient. They're like, when they're done talking to you, they just leave. Ah! <laughs>